So the first talk is from University of Illinois, Chicago, and, and it's a collaboration with uh, Illinois, Chicago University and uh, Intel. Uh, I think Shamma Nasreen uh, will be the speaker, and the topic is uh, towards co-designing neural network function approximators with NSRAM computing. All right, take it away. Please. Hi everyone, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, if you can go to full screen mode, please. And you have 10 minutes, so yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Shamman Astrin, a fourth year PhD student at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a co-design approach for computing memory inference for deep neural networks. So as we all know, deep neural networks are pretty hyped up right now, and the applications for them are increasing day by day because of their superior uh, generalization and learning capacity. Uh, DNNs are uh, successfully used in autonomous driving, natural language processing, healthcare, and many more other applications. However, DNN has a large number of parameters and naturally, uh, DNN presents very critical inference constraints when considering real-time uh, low-power applications. And to address uh, these constraints, computing memory approach is gaining more and more attention nowadays. Basically, in this approach, uh, we are we can avoid high data traffic between processor and memory units. Not only that, in uh, in memory computing, we can actually reduce the number of uh, operations which are used in typical uh, deep neural network. If we give an example, accumulation of products uh, of inputs and weights at a neuron age simply reduces to current or charge summation over a wire in in memory computation. In uh, recent years. Uh, Actually, there are several work uh, in, in this area. However, uh, many critical limitations uh, still remains, which limits the scalability of the processing. One of the uh, critical limitations uh, that in-memory computing has is if we want to do uh, multi-bit operations, we need to have DACs at each row. For example, to compute uh, the inner product of L element weights and inputs, we will have L DAX and uh, one ADC. And uh, to compute one single column, all the DAX will be concurrently active. And uh, DAX are very, I mean, high area and high power. So, I mean, it will be definitely uh, introduce some area and power overhead. And also with the increasing number of precision of operands, the design of DAX are also becomes uh, also becoming very complex. And one way to solve this issue is just don't go for high precision applications, go for single bit precision. But the problem with single bit precision is if we go for complex data set, the, uh, I mean, we lose accuracy and we definitely don't want that. So, uh, and the second critical limitation is we need ADCs to digitize the inner product of input and weight. And we need actually very high precision ADCs if we increase the input precision and number of cells uh, being summed. So what to uh, do to solve these issues? So to solve the limitations, we are proposing a multiplication free neural network operator. This is actually eliminating the need for uh, the multiplication of a high, I mean, uh, multi-bit input and weight. What we are doing here, we are uh, multiplying, I mean, if we uh, see equation one, we are multiplying the sine bit of input, which is a single bit with uh, the multi-bit of weights. And in the second part, we are uh, multiplying the sine bit of weight. And uh, I mean, single bit of 
sine bit of weight uh, with multi bit inputs. So this multiplication free operator uh, is actually inherently designed to. Uh, I mean, avoid the multiplication of multi bit uh, inputs and weights. And we also uh, reformulate the equation one as equation two to make it more uh, hardware friendly. Because uh, what we are doing here, we are just replacing this sine of X as step of X. So step of X is nothing but like it will either give me zero and one. So if we want to implement it with a SRAM array, it will definitely gives us uh, some advantages in hardware. And also uh, we are reformulating the equation one to equation two to minimize the dynamic energy of the computation. And uh, the third contribution of this work is uh, that we are exploiting the parasitic capacitance of the SRAM array to implement the uh, digital to analog converter of successive approximation based ADCs. So, uh, and this again uh, is helping us to reduce the ener energy consumption and also it is reduces the precision constraints of ADC. It's like if we uh, want to go for high precision, like 8 bit to 16, I mean 8 bit or 16 bit uh, ADC implementation, then again it will become complex and power hungry. But with our uh, implementations, we are, I mean, removing reducing that limitations. And this is the circuit level design of the proposed design, a uh, proposed approach. So uh, we are uh, here. We are um, showing a micro array of our design. So these box are nothing but SRAM cells and uh, the way we are doing it, we are uh, designing uh, an SRAM array and dividing it into two halves. So here the left half is, uh, I mean, doing all the multiplication and addition, and the right half is uh, digitizing the accumulated value from the left half. And the two half are basically symmetrical. We can, I mean, uh, interchange the operations between these two halves. And how we map the data in the this SRAM array, it is show, it is shown in the in this figure. So what we are doing, we are using a micro channel uh, for the inputs, and all the weights are mapped in the SRAM array. So when we are, uh, I mean, doing the operation of sine bit of weight, I mean sine bit of X and multiplication of W, what we are doing, we are uh, loading the sine bit of uh, X, I mean sine bit of input in the micro channels and uh, the uh, eight, we are doing it for eight bit weights. So all the eight bits of the weights are uh, stored in the uh, SRAM array is in the row wise manner, like uh, I mean, we the array is a size of 8 by 62. So eight rows, each row of each column are basically storing each bit of the weights. Like if we have eight bits, all the eight bits are stored in the column wise. So first column will have eight bit of first weight, second column, second weight, like in this manner. And we will do two minutes. OK, and we will do all the I mean computation in this manner. And this is the results. And uh, so basically if I mean energy wise, 44% uh, of the energy are uh, going for MAV operation, which is like single bit multiplication, a uh, single bit multiplication of weights and the inputs and 40 percent is uh, going for the SAR, I mean, uh, ADC applications. 
and we are using 45 nanometer technology for uh, for this application. And we are uh, gaining uh, 105 tops per watt uh, with our proposed technique, which is uh, much more higher than the, I mean, techniques which people are using in in the past. And we can also uh, combine this approach with the uh, with digital approach as well. It's like uh, even if we do uh, like 85% of our operation in in memory and other 15% uh, uh, operation in digital, then the accuracy increases. We will lose a little bit of, uh, I mean, energy wise, but again, this uh, this will be much more better application. So to conclude our work, uh, in this work, we uh, propose a multiplication free operation, which is reducing the need for uh, DAC at each uh, row. And we are also uh, introducing, uh, I mean, SRAM based ADC operations. And we did uh, our we did test our work with uh, CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, and also MNIST, and we are uh, gaining much more higher accuracy than the binarized neural network. And also, uh, energy-wise, we are uh, gaining than the, I mean, equivalent uh, multi-bit precision work. Thank you, Shum. Thank you, Thank you That's really good. The next presentation is on platform aware resource allocation for inference on multi accelerator edge devices. This is a work from Intel, uh, Shiva Kumar Ram Ramakrishnan, Shaurab, and Satyam did the work. Shaurab is going to present. Shaurab, so, are you ready? Can you? Yes, I can. Uh, can you guys see me, hear me loud and clear, and can you see the screen? We can hear you and we can see the screen. Yes, please go awesome. forward. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for inviting us for this talk. Uh, it's uh, quite a privilege to be surrounded with such uh, great presentation presenters and authors. Uh, excellent work I've seen so far. Uh, so giving uh, context on, uh, you know, before I speak, uh, we do work for Intel, but the views that we are expressing, these are ours, our own. Uh, and uh, going into the uh, further uh, uh, content that we have, you know, Primarily, uh, machine learning is a field that is evolving very fast, uh, as we, as well, all of us are experiencing. Uh, the discussion today is going to surround, uh, rather than looking at machine learning in isolation, and uh, we want to really look at a multi-application uh, computing device. And we, we want to look at a platform as a whole, and machine learning being one of the ingredients of that platform. If we just try to optimize machine learning in isolation, we may not be optimally using the resources available to the platform, uh, and we may end up negatively affecting user experience of the user. Sometimes we would be overutilizing the resources, or sometimes we would be underutilizing them, and in both cases, we would be affecting user experience. Right? Multitasking computing device, which is not a like an appliance, it has resources that are being shared, like a personal computer, right? Memory is a resource, power is a resource, and the uh, uh, compute that is available is a resource, among others. Uh, uh, you know, connectivity being another one, you know, network ba bandwidth being another one, uh, and a lot of these uh, applications tend to now uh, also offload to the cloud for various reasons. Sometimes it is for cost, sometimes it is for responsiveness. So this uh, distributed kind of a computing environment which needs to use the resources locally and on the cloud available uh, uh, leading up to the to the best user experience is what is the context of the talk today. OK, uh, when we say in a PC, uh, AI is quite pervasive now. Uh, AI is being used in various scenarios, uh, you know, productivity applications used for, let's say, sentence auto completion for NLP usages, or uh, you know, creator applications used for, uh, you know, you know, they're using GANs to change images, for example. 
right? In case of gaming, uh, it's quite used for you know things like ray tracing or uh, background segmentation or uh, increasing resolution of images. Uh, developers use it for uh, you know like uh, Visual Studio Code has something like IntelliSense to auto complete your syntax. Uh, similarly, applications uh, in the security domain use AI for uh, detecting, uh, you know, whether something is a malware or not. So I can go on and on and on, uh, and I would still feel short of the gamut of applications and the spectrum of uh, the compute that they offer. You know, like some AI is using LSTM, which is very different than maybe a convolution or something which is transformer based. So even AI has a lot of different, um, you know, kind of compute profiles, and then it also depends on what kind of hardware you're running it on. You know, the, the same uh, workload running on a CPU device on a particular uh, vector width would be very different than another CPU on on the same device, or even a, a GPU or an accelerator, right? So there are a lot of different ways we can run AI. So we, it's very important for us to understand how to run AI and where to run AI, right? Uh, and it's very important for us to, you know, really uh, think in terms of uh, user experiences at the end of the day, because that's what, uh, you know, AI was meant for. It's it's meant to improve the lives of the users that are uh, using it. And us having a very uh, isolated view when optimizing AI. Uh, can actually defeat the very purpose why AI is being used, right? Now, uh, going by that thought, you know, we should also see that AI applications are not very different than, um, say, other applications, you know, like, so we need to factor in uh, some of the uh, indicators that are being used for other applications, things like how much are we utilizing memory, how much is my startup time, how much can I scale to the, all the available compute resources? Uh, you know, whether I can run not, let's say, I have a dedicated accelerator, whether I, my, my AI can run on it or not. So when I'm making those choices, I need to be aware about, you know, my system as a whole, right? Uh, if I want the same application to scale to the cloud, I need to factor in whether I can run within a container, whether I can run on, in a VM, or whether I can run in a in a way where it is secure and I'm not uh, proliferating the secrets of my user or the IP that I, I am encompassing, right? So these are all the things that we have to factor in uh, when we are thinking of uh, optimizing uh, the AI, right? It, as, a, as an example, we may end up, uh, you know, quantizing something uh, and we may end up hurting it in a way where, uh, you know, the same model may not run in an optimal way on a different piece of hardware, right? So these are all the things. So that's the problem state uh, that we want to cover today, right? And it's in the PC ecosystem space where a mainstream PC developer uh, tends to make choices uh, which are important to him. And, and these PC developers want to have a very simplified view, simple way to do AI. Sorry for interrupting, Saurabh. Sure. We are only seeing the introductory slide. Oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm switching. I'm, I'm okay. going to switch. Sorry. All right. I, I just wanted to make sure that we are uh, seeing the correct slide. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, going into the, you know, so the developer wants to pick really simple APIs. He, he doesn't want to get into the nitty gritty details about managing the accelerators and uh, doing specialized programming. Uh, knowing uh, you know how to hand optimize these things, so the mainstream PC developer doesn't either. He doesn't have the competency, time, or uh, you know the cost associated with it to do hand optimizations for uh, making these choices for it. And one of the things you know among by any means, I'm not promoting one of the approach, but uh, one of the things that Microsoft's been driving and we've been working on within Intel is is uh, an approach with. Uh, runtime called uh, Windows ML or Onyx Runtime, it, and you know most of the work that I'm going to talk about is around it, surrounding it. So I'm going to quickly give an introduction to it. It is layered. Uh, it gives offers, uh, you know, three simple APIs to load the model and, and then to bind bind resources to it and then to just evaluate it. And it, uh, you know, the backends are uh, again is a spectrum of it, um, ARM or x86 based or uh, GPUs of all uh, kinds, 
and um, it works on you know windows or any other you know most of the mainstream op operating systems like android and mac os and things like that right uh, so you know earlier when i was mentioning uh, you know these are the uh, constraints that that mainstream pc developer uh, is uh, is going through uh, you know it's exists it's it's a fact now that cloud is a very important piece uh, the big models uh, megatrons of the world or you know turing's those uh, running in the cloud which provide uh, human parity in uh, in their accuracy what they are able to achieve and so it's very important for these applicants applications to use the cloud properly, right? And when models are written, the data scientist is writing the models. He's writing sometimes for the cloud or sometimes he's writing it for the device. And the constraints end up very, very different. While running it in on, the, on the cloud means I want to maximize the utilization of my uh, you know, provisioned hardware. Whether I'm running on the CPU, I want to maximize every uh, squeeze and every bit of juice available in that uh, VM or CPU that is being hosted on the cloud. While on a PC environment, um, you know the the user is the boss, and I want to have additional constraints that that my image is not jittery, I'm not uh, negatively affecting any other application that is running. If I'm running AI in the background, let's say I am cataloging pictures in my PC. Right, identifying faces. I'm not, you know, making, uh, you know, wo uh, word editing application slower by any means, or you know, the launch times are getting negatively impacted. So, you know, the data scientist is again uh, either not aware or this is too complex of a problem sometimes for him to handle either. And the constraints are very different, often on edge, multi PC uh, environment a multi-application uh, environment in a PC, then uh, an appliance like an Edge, uh, like an Alexa kind of a you know, standalone device, which is not doing nothing but AI. Uh, so the Edges is also of uh, different kinds. So we did the study. Two minutes. Sure. So we did the study uh, we, uh, you know, where we saw that uh, AI has up to 2x uh, effect in performance on, on a foreground app. Uh, and this was sort of uh, an eye opener for us that you know we need to really think about how AI is impacting the rest of the platform. Small models like even SqueezeNet uh, and ResNet 50, we're seeing uh, you know more than 50% of performance hit uh, up to 2x. Right, you can see that here. Uh, these are mainstream applications affecting affecting their launch times, and you know overall just responsiveness uh, of various activities that we are doing. Right. And uh, similarly, gaming uh, is uh, another piece where we saw a similar hit in performance up to 2x just because uh, workload ended up on the wrong accelerator. Right. Uh, and based on that, we, we did uh, come up with an algorithm. It's called Iris. Uh, the more details are in the paper uh, that you can get into and jump over to the results. That uh, if we make more informed choices, if we make more uh, up, you know, choices which take the whole system into account and really prioritize the impact to the user. Uh, we can basically reduce uh, the overall system impact of doing AI, you know, making more informed choices of how much threads we use, how we prioritize the threads, uh, making more informed choices and in algorithms that we are cho choosing and, and making sure that we are not, you know, bloating the memory, for example. Right, uh, and and this has led to uh, an improvement in uh, you know overall system responsiveness of things. Um, and now I'm going to just uh, go into the conclusions that you know more or less summarizing the things that I discussed. Uh, where uh, you know we want to when even when we're looking at AI in isolation, we should first think about the scenario that we're targeting and and, and not forget what AI was meant for. So you know the performance should be measured beyond just inferences per second, factoring in other things that I mentioned. Uh, you know, in a it's not all about maximizing utilization, uh, and the comprehensive set of uh, metrics should include other things. Uh, uh, you know, an iris uh, algorithm that has been mentioned in the paper factors in all these things, uses heuristics to make more informed choices, to give suggestions to the uh, software stack. 
of how uh, it can be uh, more effective in improving the performance. Uh, let's pivot to the next one. The last one in this series, oh, sorry, the last one, but one is the AttendNet's uh, tiny deep image recognition neural network for the edge via visual attention codensers. Alexander Wong, uh, Wong from University of Waterloo and I think Darwin AI is going to present. Uh, Alexander, you can take it away. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. You see the so, okay, perfect. I'm going to try to share my slides right now. Uh, can you see my slides? Not yet. There we go. All right, we see it. Thank you. OK, perfect. So uh, I guess uh, since we're over time, I will try to keep it short as possible. So uh, here I'm talking, we'll be talking about our, uh, I guess, work on attendance, uh, which is uh, tiny uh, deep neural networks uh, focused on the notion of visual attention condensers uh, from University of Waterloo as well as Darwin AI. So <laughs> motivation, uh, we. Since we're in this uh, workshop, we all know what that is. Uh, and there's been a lot of different, uh, I guess, uh, efforts into efficient deep learning, ranging from model compression to efficient architecture designs. We all know what the papers are. There's so many of them. But one particular area that is not as well explored and hasn't actually been explored is uh, the notion of self-attention for the notion of efficient deep learning. A lot of people have focused on self-attention for improving accuracy, but people have not looked into it in terms of how you can actually leverage uh, selective attention to build more efficient standalone building blocks for deep learning. And that's what we try to tackle. And so the main contribution of our work is what we call attendants, which are low precision, highly compact deep neural network architectures that are tailored for on-device image recognition, centered around deep self-attention uh, architectures where we introduce the notion of visual attention condensers which are standalone attention mechanisms for efficient spatial channel selective attention plus and we then once we've introduced this visual attention condenser actually leverage it to create unique machine design macro architecture and micro architecture designs tailored for efficiency using a machine driven design exploration approach and so first we'll talk about our, the visual attention condensers, where, which is uh, something that uh, we introduce as a building block for deep, efficient deep learning. So much of the research, as I mentioned, in self-attention has focused on accuracy. So here in the realm of computer vision, uh, most of self-attention has largely explored as mechanisms for augmenting existing CNNs. So if we're talking about things like uh, uh, you know, uh, squeeze and excite and so on and so forth, where they wrap around uh, existing CNN architectures. So it improves accuracy at the expense of architectural and computational complexity. So here, what we decided to do was introduce the notion of visual attention condensers, which are standalone efficient self-attention mechanisms that does not need to be wrapped around existing convolutional constructs. And the main premise behind visual attention condensers is that it is based around the premise on, can we learn embeddings or condensed embeddings at a reduced dimensionality for characterizing joint spatial channel activation relationships so that we can help the network focus on what's important in a very efficient manner. And so a visual attention condenser can be seen on the top right, and it's comprised of a down mixing layer, which reduces channel the dimensionality for improving efficiency, a <laughs> condensation layer, which further condenses the information, uh, where it then goes into a embedding structure that learns a condensed embedding of the uh, attention uh, based on the joint spatial channel activation relationships. So we have a lower dimensional embedding construct, which then goes back into a expansion layer to increase it back to the original dimensionality so that it can then be uh, combined with the original input it through a selective attention layer to focus certain areas of the uh, particular feature map input to then allow us to get the result. And then we have a final up mixing layer that will increase the dimensionality back to the original dimensionality. So that's one way we're able to then have a nice balance of improving attention, uh, improving modeling uh, efficacy while improving uh, efficiency as well. And so given this new uh, visual attention condenser, if we then take this as well as uh, other building blocks and put it into a automatic generation approach where we use a machine driven design exploration approach to automatically generate macro architecture and micro architecture designs for the final attention net architecture. And the, the way we use it is we use something called generative synthesis as a, a mechanism 
mechanism for machine-driven design exploration, which is based on the notion of a constraint optimization problem that you see here, where we are trying to learn the best generator that can best generate networks that meet a certain set of conditions, as uh, indicated here by the indicated function. And the two constraints we leverage here in the indicator function is you can use whatever building blocks you want, whatever micro architecture, macro architecture design you want, as long as we achieve greater than or equal to 71% top one accuracy on the ImageNet Edge Vision benchmark, uh, which is essentially right now uh, the state of art top one accuracy for uh, networks of this type, as well as an additional constraint of 8 bit uh, weight precision. And so based on this, uh, the machine-driven design exploration, plus the introduce, uh, introduction of the visual attention condenser, it's able to create not one, but a number of different AttendNet architectures. And so what you see here is AttendNet A and AttendNet B. And there are three key characteristics that are worth noting. One is they have very high macroarchitecture and microarchitecture diversity, mainly because they're designed uh, using a machine-driven design exploration approach. So every single block and unit has a different architecture and the ordering and sequencing and which architectures to uh, building blocks to use is completely determined from an algorithmic perspective. So the other thing you'll notice here is that it has very lightweight design patterns. <laughs> In fact, for a tenant A and a tenant B, outside of the initial spatial uh, standard spatial uh, convolution, everything else are not spatial convolutions. There are depth-wise convolutions. They are uh, you know, point-wise convolutions, as well as other constructs that have very low weight costs. And finally, it has a very heavy use of visual attention condensers early on before switching to a projection, expansion, projection, expanding uh, kind of design pattern later in the architecture. So what this illustrates is based on the machine-driven design, it feels that uh, selective attention is a lot more important earlier on before moving on to the next part. And so here are some Time of the results. Two minutes. Yes, here are some of the results that we got. And so what you can see here is that the attendant architecture, both A and B, achieved the highest top one accuracy compared to all the tested efficient deep uh, image recognition networks. Uh, and more specifically, what you can see is comparing to the state of the art uh, Adelnet A, it's a, the attendant A is able to have 2.1 times fewer parameters, 1.5. Uh, three times fewer multi multiply add operations, as well as 8.4 times uh, lower weight memory requirements. And if we compare to uh, another well-known architecture, such as MobileNet V2, the AttendNet B is able to achieve 3% higher accuracy, while almost three times fewer parameters, 1.57 times fewer multiply adds, as well as around 11.72 times lower weight memory requirements. So we see a lot of promise in this combination of a uh, machine-driven design exploration approach and a visual attention condensers approach. So what's next? We aim to explore effectiveness of attend nets for different downstream tasks, such as object detection, segmentation, pose estimation, so on and so forth. We want to also look at different design choices for the actual visual attention condenser itself. And finally, there's been a lot of research where they found that uh, using self-attention might improve robustness against adversarial uh, examples. And that's something that we aim to explore. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Alex. This is brilliant. All right, so we can do a quick pivot now to Ahmed. Ahmed, are you? Is your yes. uh, audio you working? Me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. And can you see it? Yeah, we can see it. All right, go for it. Okay, that's perfect. And you seen the full screen mode, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, and today I will be presenting our joint work with Media Research and my advisor, Professor Diana Marculescu. So in this work, we investigate and improve the performance and power efficiency of distributed aerial training on CPGPU systems. And we are doing this by approaching the problem, not only from the GPU macro architecture perspective, but following a holistic system level analysis approach. So let's get started with the system level mapping of RL algorithms on CPGPU systems. So although there are a few examples of end-to-end -end GPU based implementations, traditionally RL algorithms are CPU based. And recently, state-of-the-art implementations utilize both CPUs and hardware accelerators such as TPUs and GPUs. So this figure shows the system-level mapping of RL workloads on hardware platforms, and the environment is mostly mapped to CPUs, whereas the agent or the learner is mostly mapped to GPUs. 
And scaling RL training performance and understanding the hardware implications of CPU GPU systems is still an open research problem. And our goal in this work is to investigate and optimize the performance and power efficiency of RL training on CPU GPU systems. So before going into the results, uh, let me introduce the CRL framework that we use in our analysis. In CRL framework, actors run on CPU in parallel, each of them running multiple environments, and learner performs both inference and training on TPUs or GPUs. So the actor runs the environment, sends the observation to the learner, and learner updates its model and also performs the inference which generates the action to be performed on the environments. So these figures on the bottom show the human normalized scores in Arcade learning environment, or CRL, in terms of environment frames and training time on the x-axis. So based on these results, we can say that CRL runs more than 40 billion environment frames, which is on par with state-of-the-art RT-duty algorithm. However, it achieves 3x shorter wall time, which shows the massive amount of required computational resources. So it is extremely compute intensive, and this is a real tree burner in terms of power consumption, which needs to be addressed by further analysis. So let me explain our methodology. Uh, we use RTD2 implementation from the CRL framework, which is a state-of-the-art distributed RL framework from Google. And we use the Arcade Learning Environment. So our system level experiments are done on a DGX1 machine, which has 8 GB, 100 GPUs, and 20 core Intel Xeon CPU, which has 40 hardware threads in total. We also use NVIDIA profiler tools like NSI systems and NVProf profiling tools. So for the GPU hardware analysis, we use an in-house architectural simulator called MERX Sim, which is an ultra-fast trace-based architectural simulator, and it actually gives a highly accurate correlation to GV100 silicon, which we also use in our uh, system level experiments. Okay, so to identify the performance bottlenecks of RL training on CPU GPU systems, we first analyze the GPU microarchitecture by performing a GPU performance bottleneck breakdown uh, for the state of the art CRL on an NVIDIA V100 GPU. So we break down the overall execution time by GPU microarchitectural components like actual compute, assignment utilization, DRAM bandwidth, and we call everything as memory others, but you can find the details in the paper. So, for example, uh, the green bar shows the performance reduction caused by SM underutilization when compared to 100% utilized SM. And similarly, the red bar shows the performance overhead introduced by the baseline DRAM bandwidth when compared to a GPU with infinite DRAM bandwidth. So, this figure shows that actual compute, SM utilization, and DRAM bandwidth contribute 57%, 15%, and 12%, respectively, to overall GPU execution time limitation. This means that even with a zero latency and unbounded bandwidth, GPU with perfect SM utilization, like an ideal GPU microarchitecture case, there is a less than a factor of two potential performance improvement possible through GPU microarchitectural optimization. So we conclude that based on today's memory technologies, the GPU microarchitecture itself is well balanced for the state-of-the-art RL framework. And we conclude that uh, we should now shift our focus to CPU GPU system level analysis. So our first uh, conclusion in this paper is that architects should not solely focus on GPU microarchitecture and instead focus on system level analysis for RL training. And then to understand the importance of CPU GPU interactions and relative performance, we swapped a number of simulation actors to investigate the impact on runtime and GPU power consumption. So this figure shows the impact of number of actors uh, on normalized execution time and GPU power as number of actors increases from 4 to 256. So scaling the number of CPU-based actors from 4 to 40 provides an almost 6x speed up, whereas scaling uh, from 40 to 256, it only gives us 2x operational speed up, even though we increase the number of actors by more than 6x. So although scaling up the number of actors achieves impressive performance improvement for up to 40 actors, it yields diminishing returns beyond that point, likely due to CPU resources being fully saturated. So we conclude that performance scalability is primarily limited by the total number of CPU hybrid threads, which is 40 in our system. And then we also perform a performance per GPU watt analysis, and we show that overall GPU power efficiency improves with the growing number of factors, and overall energy per task decreases. 
So this is because GPU power consumption at low utilization is relatively high around 70 watts and performance increases faster than the additional power consumption. So our second conclusion in this paper is that system bottlenecks that limit environment interaction are the primary performance and power efficiency limiters in our training. Okay, so to strike right balance between CPU and GPU resources for our training, we propose a new system design metric, uh, CPU-GPU ratio, which we define as the ratio between CPU hardware threads and GPU SNs in the system. And since we are limited by the number of CPU hardware threads in our system, which is hard to modify, we explore this uh, metric by gradually disabling SMs on a real V100 GPU to mimic further scaling of CPU-GPU ratio. So this figure shows these measures slow down with respect to a baseline configuration with eight SMs. And running with the half of the number of SMs, 40 SMs, yields only 6% slowdown, which implies larger GPU resource underutilization uh, due to insufficient active throughput at the system level. And on the other end, uh, if, you, if, you, if you reduce the number of SMs too much, GPU can become the bottleneck at the system level, as in this case, like two SMs. And if you look at the existing CPU-GPU systems, such as the DGX1, uh, that has CPU-GPU ratio of 1 over 16. And recently, DGX A100 has improved the CPU-GPU GPU ratio to 1 over 4, but still this is insufficient, as our results show that the CPU-GPU ratio needs to be at least 1 or higher to achieve good efficiency. So we conclude that future well-balanced RL-optimized systems will require more than 16x and 4x improvement in CPU-GPU ratio when compared to DGX1 and DGX A100 systems respectively. So our last conclusion in this paper is that CPU-GPU ratio is a convenient rule of thumb to help system architects to design scalable and efficient CPU-GPU systems for RL training. Okay, so, so to sum up, uh, we investigate and identify the primary system level design parameters for improving the performance and power efficiency of distributed area training on CPU GPU systems. Our findings indicate that modern GPU microarchitectures are relatively well balanced for the state of the art distributed area training. And we show that environment interactions and its related hardware resources are the primary performance and power efficiency bottlenecks in today's CPU GPU RL systems. And to this end, we propose a new convenient CPU-GPU ratio design metric for designing well-balanced, scalable and efficient CPU-GPU platforms for RL training. And finally, we conclude that CPU-GPU based RL systems should be equipped with CPU hardware threads that are equal to or higher than the number of GPU SMs to enable significant improvements in performance and also power efficiency for distributed RL training. So that concludes my talk. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Ahmed. This was very good. All right, so this concludes our first paper session.